I'm a geoscientist. I've studied geology in a thousand ways. There is nothing more exciting than actually drilling a well and recovering specimens from drilling that well and studying it directly. Because you don't know what's down there. And then when you test it with the drill bit and you actually look at what's down there, it's the most exciting thing you can do in geosciences, in my opinion. Methane hydrate is an ice lake solid. If you take natural gas, you combine it with water, you lower the temperature and you raise the pressure, it forms this substance that very much looks like snow or ice. So it's thought that 15% or more of the world's organic carbon is locked up in these methane hydrates. It's a dynamic carbon reservoir that is con continually uh, emitting methane into the oceans and potentially the atmosphere. There's been an enormous amount of attention in general on what's called the carbon cycle, and this is a key part of the carbon cycle. So we started this project more than 10 years ago, and, and I remember our team wrote a proposal. We said, we're going to go sample these things in the Gulf, and we're going to study the whole hydrate system. And uh, the DOE came back and said, uh, we don't think you can really necessarily do that. We want you to demonstrate the ability just to recover those samples. So in 2017, we went out there, we drilled a hole, and we sampled a hydrate interval, and we recovered those cores successfully. That gave DOE the confidence that we could design a larger expedition that would measure all these things, from the microbiology to the geochemistry, to measure the in-situ pressure and temperature to understand the whole hydrate system. This expedition couples scientists from geochemistry, pore water geochemistry, microbiology, slope stability, rock properties, all in a multidisciplinary effort to understand this system. In 2017, uh, we recovered cores from 100 miles offshore and a mile beneath the ocean. We recovered those cores at pressure, and we brought them all the way back to here, what we call the Pressure Core Center uh, at the University of Texas. This facility was designed on two principles, safety and stability, not only for our personnel, but for our pressure cores as well. We better get jackets on. Absolutely. Because uh, uh, it's pretty cold in there. So here we have our methane hydrate pressure cores. As we said before, these cores are stored in pressure vessels, a little over a meter long. We're constantly supplying 3,500 psi of water to these cores to keep them stable at pressure. You can see we have four cores here. These are from 2017. We used to have about 20. At the end of this upcoming expedition, if all goes well, we're going to have about 50 of these pressure cores that will form the foundation for our future analyses. Josh, let's show them the triaxial device. Uh, this instrument is really cool. It's a pressurized triaxial device. We take the specimens from the other room, we load them in here, and we recreate the in situ pressure and stress in the earth from where these samples came from. Once we do that, we can measure how fluids flow through the rock, what the strength of the rock is, and how the rock deforms. So what's really exciting about the new mission is instead of samples from one layer in the earth, we're getting pressure core samples from over 3,000 feet of depth, and we're going to be able to look at the different properties as a function of how deeply buried these rocks were. All of that's going to happen in this laboratory. I'm an undergrad research assistant, so I help out Josh and Dr. Flemings in the lab. So I was reading online for open positions in research, and I found the geotech and geomechanics lab, and I read about it, and I just got really interested in it. So I asked Dr. Flemings if I could come in and see the projects they were working on. And I just got started here. They threw me into the hydrate studies, and I got really into it. I hope they give me a chance to work on depressurizing those cores or just analyzing the cores whenever they come in. And, and uh, are your parents excited about this adventure? Oh yeah, my mom's a little scared, but they're happy, they're proud, I guess. Terrific. Today's a Friday. In theory, 
a week from today, we will fly to Houma, Louisiana, where we will then get in a helicopter and go offshore. As of today's current understanding of, of what the timing is. Welcome to the Q4000. This is the helipad where we first arrive on the ship. So right ahead of me, we have the drill floor where we drill our well and take our samples. We then have all of these shipping containers on the right where we process our core and run all of our different experiments. So if we go this way, we can head inside. So this is inside where we have all of our offices and living quarters. Yeah. So now we're on the living quarters floor. People are sleeping at pretty much every hour of the day, so we have to be pretty quiet. And then here we have our crew mess where we get meals four times a day. And this is my room that I share with three other members of the science party. Um, we each have our own bunk bed with curtains where we can kind of close ourselves off if we're sleeping. And this is where we've been living for the month. Well, as you know, it's been a, it's been a slow start here. And, and I'm at the point where I now feel like Everybody's starting to get together on their roles and responsibilities. We're starting to see the core come out of the ground. We're starting to approach the rates that in our planning we wanted to approach. And, uh, and that's a good feeling. What we gotta do now is just keep these crews working together. It, it's so easy to make one mistake in a hundred step scenario, and then all of a sudden you're back to uh, square one. Hey, it's Fleming's Peter. Can you, can you tell me where we're at here? Okay, that's all I want to know. Yeah? yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye. It's 11.10 uh, at night. We flew out by helicopter uh, eight days ago. We've been coring out here 24 hours a day. We've advanced our, our hole significantly to our eighth core. It was incredibly exciting to start seeing uh, all the scientists out here look at their first core and start analyzing those cores and start the workflow of how every lab is doing what process. That moment where all of a sudden you've orchestrated all these pieces that now uh, the science, which is what we came to do here, we can start doing the science was uh, really uh, moving. And when we were out here in 2017, we drilled an entire well and we had one successful pressure core and no pressure cores in the reservoir. And then we moved over and then we took a break and everybody scratched their head, sort of looked at the tool, figured out some problems with the tool, re-ran it, and then we had a very successful second well. But the net effect was half of our pressure cores failed completely. So, and, and, and again, an offline issue is that there's been well, it's 2017 to now and three field tests and various improvements in that technology to get us to where this tool is performing today. I always find it fascinating to think about what the tool is feeling. And so, you know, just to, just to think about when you, when you jam that thing in, that's the frictional heating. And to actually see that as opposed to have somebody tell you in a textbook it's going to happen, I, I find fascinating. All right. Go to bed, everybody. Right. We're done. Methane hydrate is very much like what water ice looks like. It's uh, a solid, cold substance, um, but of course the difference is it has methane gas. 
and it's really only stable at unique conditions. It's, it's, you can't really have it exist here in atmospheric conditions. You got to have really high pressure and cold temperatures like we have directly underneath of us in the bottom of a deep ocean um, before the sediments get too warm. So there's this Goldilocks window where hydrate is stable. Um, we understand those conditions pretty well. And what we're trying to do now is, is recover it and study it, but that's more challenging um, as we're finding out. Methane hydrate is frozen methane. And we find frozen methane all over the world. There's a lot of it, but we actually really have a really, really poor understanding of how much there is. We know there's a lot, but our estimates vary by what we call orders of magnitude, which is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. We're actually four orders of magnitude off. And, and if we take those numbers and then try to plug them into like how carbon moves over the entire earth, um, that creates a lot of uncertainty with how much impact releasing or storing methane hydrate can have. So one of my big questions is to try to figure out how much hydrate there is on Earth. And, and I need to understand how systems like this work so that I can understand how the larger system works. There was initially, a, in the history of hydrate research, there was a lot of ex, like excitement, I would say, or, or at least concern that the hydrates could catastrophically destabilize and go right to the atmosphere and bring lots of methane to the atmosphere and warm the climate. In the last, I would say, 20 years easily, we've come to realize that most of that methane is probably gonna get consumed in the ocean and become CO2 and very little of it would make it out to the atmosphere. And another kind of realization is that there's not a way to really destabilize a lot of it all at once. The most exciting um, part of marine geology is when you can go out and explore and get new information about the environment you're studying. And a lot of that can happen in the water column, it can happen on the seafloor. But when you get to go back through time, for me, that's the more exciting aspect. We can start to reconstruct how the ocean changed through time. And um, to me, that's, you know, that's probably the most exciting thing that's reason to be out here is because we're expanding our knowledge by going back in time, uh, potentially, and sort of reconstructing that. History is our challenge as cinematologists. Let's try it, shall we? So what I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to explain how we collect our cores and get a complete section of the geology of interest below the seabed. I'm going to start with this relatively simple diagram. Let me quickly explain. This is the sea surface. This is the Q4000 drill rig. Down here is the seabed. The water depth in the location where we're drilling is about uh, 6,000, so it's about 6,000 feet. And we're interested in the geology of the sediments and rocks beneath the sea floor. And we're interested in going down here about a further 3,000 feet. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to collect a sample all the way down from the seafloor down to 3,000 feet below the seafloor. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to collect the mud and rock in a, almost a continuous plastic tube over the depths of interest. As the core is penetrating through the formation, it is collecting the mud in exactly the correct order as it was laid down in geological time. Going on core in expeditions like this, which we've done for many, many years, all right, is a lot of fun. And if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't do it. Microorganisms are responsible for making the methane that ends up accumulating in these deep marine sediments. Some ways that organisms, microorganisms survive is under conditions where there is no oxygen. And some of those organisms make methane as a waste product, which accumulates in the sediments. So they end up being buried in these sediments. They continue to be metabolically active. And as they do that, they produce methane that gradually accumulates. There may be millions of these organisms per a tiny gram of this material, maybe about the size it would fit on a dime or a quarter. 
Um, however, and they're, they're surviving, just barely surviving, but still in that survival process, they make methane that we're interested in. So our job here in this lab that's set up to study microbiology is to collect these microorganisms from the cores and preserve them in a way that microbiologists, including myself, can look at them later to study which organisms are present, how diverse their communities are, maybe even if they're, how they're alive and how to grow them. So most microbiologists do their work in a laboratory, maybe behind a computer a lot these days. But here we are, we get to be on this ship in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, coring the sea floor. This is a very special opportunity for any microbiologist to be at the place where these samples are collected, working with a team of chemists and geologists to understand this very unique and very remote environment. And for us to get a hold of these samples is very special. They're rare samples that can tell us something about the microorganisms that make methane in these methane hydrates. These methane hydrates have been thought to be a potential energy source, and let me be specific about that. What I mean is there's, there's methane, a hydrocarbon, locked in these hydrates, and the idea is that you could extract that methane or that natural gas as an energy uh, resource. And, and to be frank, there's an enormous amount of methane locked in hydrate around the world. As we look forward, and we look forward at the energy transition, there are certainly some who would argue that there will continue to be a role of natural gas over the next 20, 10 or 20 years uh, as we transition from hydrocarbons to future energy sources. And so hydrates are a potential energy source for that methane. I think the reality is, and you kind of see by being out here, uh, it's enormously expensive to imagine extracting these hydrocarbons from the deep ocean. Having said that, there are countries like Japan, like India, like China, that for domestic energy security would like to have a source of natural gas. And those countries are very focused on this as a potential source of energy to contribute to their own energy security. To be frank, there's a lot of debate about the role of natural gas uh, as we uh, transition from a hydrocarbon-based energy source to a non-hydrocarbon-based energy source. Uh, on the one hand, every time you replace a coal-based power plant with a natural gas power plant, you are reducing significantly the amount of CO2 you're putting into the atmosphere for the same amount of energy. On the other hand, uh, there are those that argue the use of any type of hydrocarbons as part of this transition is not moving us fast enough to sort of a net zero uh, non-CO2 emitting environment. So uh, that's the debate and, and we're all going to have to work out the solution to that debate and by all I mean not just domestically but uh, across the globe. This whole experience has just been amazing. And I didn't think I'd go on this project, so I was just excited to read what they find. 
you know, talk to Josh, see what they would see out here. And just to be here is incredible. You know, just to actually see it happening. And I've been doing homework in my downtime. I've been doing Dr. Fleming's graduate course homework and learning a lot about that. I feel like they see me as this really young person on here. And at first I was a little scared. There's no other undergrad. I was a little worried that I would be a little bit out of the, my zone. I'm totally out of my comfort zone for sure. So just being able to have all these mentors around me is amazing. They're all telling me about all these programs, how they got into hydrates, you know, what they do, how they were able to get into research. They're just always willing to help <laughs> and motivate, you know, motivating by putting those homeworks on the fridge. But now that I'm here, I'm, I'm very happy I chose geology over anything else to major in. So in March, I got an email from Dr. Flemings with the subject line, we're getting the band back together. And it reads, Ethan, I know you love an adventure. Any interest in coming to the States for an offshore expedition in August? Hope all is well with you and we'd love to have you, Peter. It feels like a strange fever dream, like I never left. Um, it's like a strange time warp when you come offshore and it feels like, yeah, I'm back and in, in the same place because everything, every, the rig stayed the same. Um, there's just the people are different. There's a lot more people from different universities, um, which has its benefits because um, there's a lot more kind of talent to draw from. It has a whole new host of lab techniques that we have to learn and, you know, perform as it's going on. So it makes the work a lot more varied and, you know, more interesting. Getting to know Kamir has been an incredible experience. Um, it's like so fun, the energy that undergraduates have. Um, and coming offshore as a first year undergrad is so rewarding, right? You're learning science directly at the source. Um, and that's like an incredible thing to be able to be part of. And so, yeah, getting to be around that again and seeing seeing the kind of the, the joy in, in her eyes. It's like, you know, she observes and learns and applies new practices is, is a great experience as a, someone who has been through this experience before. Out here in the vessel, a key part of the science goal was to get a systematic measurement of all the sediments uh, down to about 500 to 750 feet uh, below the sea floor. We've, we've achieved that goal. What we're gonna do now is start to rapidly drill deeper to the deeper hydrate reservoirs. Remember, we're going as deep as 3,000 feet. So uh, what I'm excited about is getting that hole deeper and now getting to these concentrated hydrate reservoirs so we can bring them up on deck, observe those, and process those cores. Often in the, in the lab or on the computer, um, we, we have a conceptual model and we build an experiment or we write a program to try to explore that conceptual model. Um, out here, um, we have somewhat of a conceptual model of what we might find, but really, a fundamental component of what we're doing is exploration. Uh, nobody has sampled these rocks where we're looking within this hydrate system. And, and we don't know exactly what we'll find, but it's those observations that are gonna drive the next generation of understanding of the hydrate system. The opportunity for people from both UT, but also scientists that are all across these different institutions to be out here to make these observations, to understand how to interpret these things, to see them in real time. We're, we're changing a generation of people by giving them that experience. And they're gonna make more of an impact in the future because of what they're learning right here. I think people have different stereotypes. One, one stereotype is that an individual scientist will toil away in the laboratory or they'll toil away deriving equations and make some discovery. And maybe, uh, maybe a more modern view is that, that everything is multidisciplinary and you have to collaborate on all these different things or you're not going to advance the science. I, I, I actually think it's, it's fundamentally both of those things. The, the scientists going out with me on this expedition, each are deeply individual scientists who have made fundamental contributions, not necessarily through some collaborative effort, but through some deep thinking and exploration on their own. On the other hand, they're trying to address a problem that they can't really get the core information unless they work as a collaborative team. 
And, and so often to break these problems apart, it has to be a multidisciplinary effort. But I don't want to understate the fact that almost every discovery I've seen at the end of the day was driven by a, an individual sort of digging deep 